Good afternoon and welcome to this free webinar on proton therapy, basic physics and technology. Our presenter today is Mr. Rolf Slavsima from the University of Florida Health Proton Therapy Institute. He has been instrumental in getting that program launched and has a long history in proton therapy. WePast offers the leading location for preparation for board exams. You can visit WePast.com to become a subscriber. As a benefit to subscribers, the recording of today's presentation will be available on the WePast.com website. So if you're not currently a subscriber, you can go ahead and subscribe and you'll be able to access this material. Current subscribers will be able to access it um, in the same place that they may have accessed the previous webinar. Now I'd like to turn it over to our presenter, Mr. Rolf Slipsema. And um, as you're going through, if you have any questions, please go ahead and just type those into the chat box, and then he will answer those for you at the end of each section. Uh, Rolf, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Mel. Um, I assume you can hear me. Um, so, yeah, my name is Rolf Slopsma, so the University of Florida Health Proton Therapy Institute. We're uh, located in Jacksonville. We've been treating with protons for 10 years now, so we're one of the older institutes in, uh, in the United States. We treat about uh, 100 patients a day uh, with protons in three gantries and basically all treatment sites. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so let's start with some disclaimers. Um, yeah, I don't really have an affiliate, uh, affiliation with the ABR besides being them, and I definitely do not know what the ABR examiners are going to ask about proton therapy. So I did uh, the exam myself, I think about six years ago, and I was for, for the whole day I was hoping that somebody would ask one proton question, but that, that question never came. But if I understand, uh, more and more proton questions are being asked. So I tried to make the presentation um, thinking about what they might ask, and I think it goes a little bit deeper than the questions you might get at the uh, at the exam. But if you sort of understand it a little bit deeper, it might help you in uh, in answering the questions. And the other disclaimer is that most of my uh, experience is with the uh, with IBA equipment. So we have IBA equipment here. I used to work for IBA, so most of the examples are IBA related. But that doesn't mean that I think that's a better system than any of the other manufacturers. Um, this is also my first webinar. It's another disclaimer. It's a little bit unsettling to talk to people without seeing them, so uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, so the learning objectives of this uh, for this presentation is um, so hopefully after this presentation you know uh, the basic interactions that protons undergo as they traverse matter, and you also know what the dose distribution looks like for a proton beam and hopefully you understand the relationship between the two. And then uh, I'll be talking about the two main accelerator types used in proton therapy systems, and I will discuss some of the delivery techniques that are used uh, today. So as you can see, this is, this is mostly uh, aimed at physics and basic technology, and I think in a couple of weeks there's another proton therapy webinar planned that's more about clinical implementation. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask them. Uh, but as you will see, there's not a whole lot of um, clinical implementation in this pre presentation. Yes, so we're going to talk about proton therapy physics first, the interactions, then the dose distributions. Then we go into the technology, so we talk about the accelerators. Um, I make a distinction between 3D conformal delivery techniques, of course, bonding to uh, 3D conformal radiotherapy that you're probably all familiar with, and pencil beam scanning, which is more related to IMRT, and then I have a few slides about shielding and radiation safety. Uh, not that I know a whole lot about that, but in case you get that question, maybe the few things I know uh, might help you. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I have a colleague that always says, uh, whenever something is simple, he says, let's start with high school physics, so let's start with high school physics. So let's talk about the physical properties of the Obviously, it's charged, which makes it um, in some sense, like an electron in terms of how it interacts with matter and unlike a photon, obviously. But the big difference with electrons is that it's, uh, it's much heavier, right? So it it's, has a mass of one uh, atomic mass unit or a rest energy of 938 MeV. 
So that's about 1,800 times as heavy as an electron. Uh, if you've been studying for your board, I'm sure you know that, that the mass of an electron is about half, uh, half an MeV. And if you look at the, the energies we use in proton therapy, um, because of the high mass uh, to be able to penetrate deep enough, we need very high en uh, kinetic energies. So we accelerate protons up to 230, 250 MeVs. And again, if you compare that to electrons, you're, you're in, a, in a range 10 as high as electrons. So what about the uh, interactions then? So the clinical energy range, so up to about 250 MeV, uh, three interactions are of importance for proton therapy. So first of all, you have the gluon interactions of the proton with the target shell electrons, which cause energy loss. Then you have Coulomb interactions with target nuclei, which cause scattering of the protons. And then you have the potential of non-elastic collisions with target nuclei. And that has some um, ramifications for activation and neutron production. So let's look a little bit uh, in more detail in the different interactions. So as I said, the main one is uh, energy loss. So because protons are charged, they have Coulomb interactions with the charged outer shell electrons of the target atoms. Um, so they can excite and ionize target electrons, mostly the outer shell electrons, and they can give off a little bit of energy, ionizing or exciting the electrons, N not unlike electrons or um, photons. right? So, uh, compared to electrons, because of the high kinetic energy, um, the energy transfer is actually very small. Um, so, that also means that the energy transfer to the secondary electron, if it's ionized, um, that energy is pretty small. And even at the, at the highest energies, about uh, of 250 MeV, the range of the secondary electron is in the order of a millimeter. And then that path, typically, of that electron is not straight. So. It, it, it basically is absorbed locally. So for all practical purposes, to these uh, shell electrons, it's absorbed locally. A photon beam, right? Skin sparing that doesn't exist in electrons. Uh, sorry, in proton therapy. Um, the other thing different with photons is that because of its charge. Uh, the electric field of the protons interacts with the electric field of the shell electrons, right? So it's sort of a, a longer distance interaction. So the proton interacts with all the electrons that it sees around its path. And depending on the distance, it might transfer more or less energy, but it's basically constantly interacting with all these electrons in the target material. And that's called the continuously slowing down. So per interaction, the energy transfer is very slow, but it has many interactions with all the electrons and continuously the proton loses its energy as it traverses them. Um, because of the large mass difference, the protons are really not deflected by, um, as I said, protons are 800 times as, as heavy, so you can imagine it's like, it's like a big bus driving through a field of flowers, right? Might slow down a little bit, but it's definitely not going to be uh, deflected. And, and compare that to electrons, right? The electrons in electron therapy also interact with the shell electrons of the atoms, but because their mass is the same, there's uh, significant deflection, significant scattering. Um, and then if you look at how does the energy transfer of the proton change with, um, with kinetic energy or with momentum, um, well, the dose deposition, the energy transfer increases as the proton slow down, right? So as the, as the, um, the proton enters the material, Material that's very high energy uh, loses little energy, but progressively it starts to slow down, and as it slows down, progressively it starts to lose more and more energy. The energy loss rate goes up, and uh, you can actually see that if you look at the beta block equation, which is um, valid for both protons and electrons, except for a factor two, I think. Um, and and don't try to memorize this thing for the board exam, but I just want to show you that if you look at the stopping power, the energy loss per distance, which can take as the as the energy transfer that's proportional to one over the speed squared, right? Bet, beta, the speed of the electron divided by the uh, the speed of light. So you can see as the speed decreases, the stopping power, the energy transfer increases. Okay. So in, in an equation that's a little bit 
difficult to see that look like uh, in a graph. And so here in this graph, I've plotted the kinetic energy of the proton and the stopping power in water. And note that I've reversed the scale, and you'll see on the next slide why I've done that. But so you can see, let's say we start with a 200 MeV proton. Stopping power is in the order of 5 MeV per centimeter. As it loses energy, the stopping power stays about the same. But as it slows down, the stopping power starts to increase exponentially. Right? And now I'll show you why I reverse the scale. So instead of looking at the energy the proton has left, now you can look at if you start with the 200 MeV proton hitting a water phantom from the left-hand side, you can look at the penetration depth, how much range it still has left, and look at the stopping power as function of penetration depth, right? Pronounced the exponential increase in stopping power. Um, so stopping power, energy loss per centimeter, is proportional to the energy absorbed per mass. So the dashed line in this graph shows again the stopping power. And now if you, uh, as I said, the dose is proportional to the stopping power. So you can see the dose profile of the monoenergetic proton beam, the 200 MeV proton beam hitting the phantom from the left-hand side. And you can look that it has this peak shaped. And if you look at the beta block equation, obviously this goes to infinity as the speed becomes zero. Well, in reality, that doesn't happen because the stopping power actually decreases again for very low energies. And also, you have something that's called um, range straggling. Because energy loss is a statistical process, the proton will have exactly the same penetration depth. So you sort of get a smearing out of this stopping power curve, and that results in the characteristic depth dose curve of a monoenergetic. You look at the green curve. That's the depth of curve for a 200 MeV proton beam in water. And you can see the penetration depth is about 26 centimeters, and there the protons stop. So this thing, well, let's see. Okay, there we go. So this thing is called the Breck peak or the Breck curve, and sometimes it's also called pristine peak and pristine meaning pristine energy, right? mono energetic beam hitting the phantom. Um, it used to be that that when people would say, like, what question do they ask at the ABR exam about proton therapy, people would say the only thing they ask is show you a break peak and you should be able to say this is a break peak right now. Um, and th this thing is actually not um, specific to protons, right? It's, it's, it's any charged particle. So an it was actually discovered uh, by William Bragg for alpha particles. Um, that show the same behavior. And electrons actually also show a similar behavior, but you don't see it in your clinical PDD because the electrons scatter all over the place and they sort of smear out the peak of the, uh, of the electron break peak. But this sort of as an aside. Okay, so we saw the break peak for a 200 MeV uh, proton beam. Uh, you can imagine that the penetration depth of range of these break peaks depends on the initial energy, right? So if you have the 70 MeV beam, the penetration depth is only 4 centimeters. If you talk about a 200 MeV beam, you penetrate uh, 26, as we saw. And if you go to the maximum energy of 250 MeV, you talk about 38 centimeter range in water. Um, so this is typically um, but you could calculate it by integrating the inver inverse of the beta block of, of the stopping power, right? The beta block equation. Okay, so that's energy loss. So that's the most important interaction. Um, so I said when the protons uh, interact with the shell of electrons, they don't scatter, but protons do scatter when they uh, interact with the uh, electric field of the target nuclei, right? So nuclei, are he nuclei are heavier than the electrons, so now you do get a deflection, but still, because of the large kinetic energy of the protons, the deflection of a single interaction is very small. But again, because it's an electric field, electric field interaction, it interacts basically with all atoms that, that it passes. Um, so there are many interactions that sort of start to spread out the beam. Uh, if you look at the energy, the scattering angle decreases with increasing proton energy. So the higher the, the higher the proton momentum, the less the scattering, which is the same as in electrons, and it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, so that means as the proton slows down, it will start to spread out more and more, right? So it will 
deposit more energy and it will spread out more towards the end of travel than at the entrance. Um, and the scatter angle is a function of the of the density of the um, of the target material and the z of the target material. So, not surprisingly, interactions will scatter more in something that's denser, like bone, than in something that's not a de as dense, like uh, like blood. Okay, so let's look at uh, let an example. So in this graph, you see depth in water, right? And the radial spread. So assume you, you, you shoot like an infinitesimally small proton beam at a phantom. How does the beam spread out as a function of depth? So it's can approximate it with a Gaussian, and this is the sigma of the Gaussian. Right? So if you take a 100 MV beam, penetrates, say, about 7 cm in, uh, in water, and you can see instead of a linear behavior, it spreads out more towards the end. Right? And you can see for higher energies, penetrates deeper, the spread becomes bigger. There's a rule of thumb, which I don't think you have to remember for your board exam, but the spread at the end of travel is about 2% of the penetration depth, right? So for this 250 MeV beam, 38 centimeter, so um, um, it's about 0.7. Okay. Um, and then, so the lateral penumbra is about 3% of the... Uh, of the penetration depth. Okay. Okay. So we talked about the two interactions, energy loss and scattering. Um, and if you just look at those interactions, that also means that all protons reach their end of travel, right? So they're not like photons that attenu attenuate. You have a certain fluence, and with depth, that fluence becomes less. But if you just look at those two interactions, each proton would uh, reach their end of travel. Well, that, that doesn't really happen. So sometimes uh, a proton hits the nucleus head on, and there's a non elastic nuclear interaction. And then the primary proton is lost from the beam. So about 10 to 15 percent of protons have a nuclear interaction. So the result of that is that you have a reduction of proton fluence with depth, right? That influences the shape of the Bragg peak. So it, it doesn't, uh, what I said, the beta block equation sort of describes the shape of the Bragg peak. That, that isn't completely true because you need to take out, you need to include this fluence effect. Um, for commissioning purposes and in practice, we measure the Bragg peak, so we include that. Uh, by just measuring it. Um, but more important is that these nuclear interactions can also create secondaries, right? It, it, it's, it hits the, the target nucleus and it kicks out a proton, a secondary proton, maybe a deuteron, um, an alpha particle, bigger recoil particles. So 60% of the energy lost in nuclear interactions is transferred, transfers, transferred to charged particles. And because they're charged, and typically they have relatively low energy, because they only get a little bit of the energy of the uh, primary protons, you can assume they're absorbed locally. But about 40% of the energy is transferred to neutral particles, uh, mostly neutrons. And because they don't uh, interact that readily, they actually leave the area of the interaction, and they're absorbed as consequences for out-of-field doses. Um, so it's always a big controversy, or there used to be a big controversy in proton therapy, what about the neutron dose? So if you irradiate a, pro a patient with protons, uh, you can roughly say that, that outside of the target there's about a 1% dose due to neutrons. And that drops off as you go away from the target, but not completely, so it's, it's basically everywhere. And it's also everywhere in the room, um, so that means you need to shield those neutrons. Um, so you're shielding, as we will see, has to deal with the uh, with the neutrons. Um, another thing is that you can with nuclear interactions is you can produce uh, unstable recoil particles, right? You can activate the uh, the target, so that it has uh, consequences for radiation safety. So all uh, elements in the uh, in the treatment machine that the beam goes through will get activated. Um, it also has a potentially nice consequence that you also activate. Um, molecules inside the patient and that radiation safety wise the, those levels are so low that it doesn't really matter but if you use a PET CT scanner you can look at some the production of some uh, beta emitters and maybe do dose verification using PET CT. Um, okay so that brings me to the to the end of the first section um, 
talking about the interaction, so energy loss and the Bragg peak, scattering, proton scatter of the target nuclei, but not that much, and nuclear interactions, some of the protons have nuclear interactions causing secondary particles and causing activation. So that brings me to the question, if there are questions, and let me move to the other screen. And so far, I don't see any questions in the chat. OK, uh, that's good, because I have a question. So a review question. Um, so when a photon and a proton traverse matter, the main difference is, um, I, I guess we're not, we're not going to um, we're not going to give the answers online, so I guess everybody needs to answer this question for themselves. So I'll give you a chance to read it, or I'll read it for you. Think about what you think the answer is, and then I'll give you the right answer. Um, okay. So when a photon and a proton traverse matter, the main difference is uh, that the photon will pass most target atoms along its path without interacting, while the proton will have small interactions with each of the target atoms around its path, or B the photon is likely to be lost, attenuated at some point, while a proton will always reach the end of its range. C, the photon will scatter, at the, uh, will scatter off the target nuclei, while the proton will move along a straight line. D, the photon cannot release, a nu cannot release neutrons while colliding with target nuclei, while a proton can. OK. So the right arms, as I said, because the proton is charged, it will uh, interact with the uh, with the charged uh, shell electrons. So B is not correct because most proton protons will reach the end of its of their range, but some will have a nuclear interaction, so some will be attenuated. Um, so pro C is not correct because protons do scatter, although not that much; they scatter a little bit. And D is not correct because photons, if the energy is high enough, uh, about 10 mV, can um, can have a nuclear interaction, photo disintegration, and uh, and release a neutron. Okay, so that was part one. Let's uh, go to part two. So now let's talk about the dose distribution. So here again, you see the uh, the Bragg peak. Um, in this case, for a range of 15 in water, and let's assume we want to cover this uh, this great target area, right? Maybe a small small brain tumor. It's not it's not that that big, or 3 cm. So obviously, if you just uh, use a monoenergetic beam, it's very sharp. There's a fall off, but you don't get uniform. Okay. So what's being done in treatment machines is actually instead of delivering a monoenergetic beam, is you add uh, beams of lower energy, and you weight them appropriately to create a flat dose distribution. Um, so, for example, we delivered a distal layer with a range of 15. Now we're going to decrease the energy to a range of 14.6. So we pull back the peak by five millimeters, and we give those in this peak. But because the distal peak already delivered those, we don't have to give as much dose as the distal peak. And if you add the two, you get the orange line, right? So you can imagine if you keep doing that, pulling back five millimeter, and for each layer giving less and less dose, if you optimize the weights or the dose in each of the peaks appropriately, you can generate a flat dose distribution inside your target region. Right? And the, the, the back typically used to create an SOBP, um, if, if it's too big, you cannot get a flat dose distribution, so you get a ripple. If it's too small, there's really no reason to put in more peaks, so it's not very efficient. So typically, the pullback is between five, six, seven, eight millimeters, something like that. It's about the width of the peak itself that uh, that the peak is pulled back. Um, okay, so this uh, this is a nice flat dose distribution that you can use to uh, to cover uh, this specific target. But if the target is bigger, obviously you need a larger uniform uh, dose region. So what you can do is add more peaks proximally. Right? And by, again, uh, adjusting the weight appropriately, you can create a flat dose distribution. So the orange one here was our first SOBP with seven pristine peaks. If I keep adding peaks proximally, for example, up to 15, you can see that the green one here, that flat dose distribution covers about 7 cm. If I go to 25 pristine peaks, um, I almost get 100% uh, dose up to skin. So, the, so you can see by, by varying that you can change 
the extent of the uniform dose region. Skin dose actually goes up, right? If the modulation width uh, increases, if you add more peaks, you also add more dose at the skin. So for a small modulation width, maybe the skin dose is 60%, but for this large one, it starts to uh, approach 80, 90%. And obviously, if you do uh, full 100% dose of the skin, it's going to be 100%. Okay, so this proton PDD, so this clinical PDD, is called the spread out break peak, right? Break peak, monoenergetic, and you spread it out by adding more of them approximately. And so the characteristics of this depth dose curve are there's a sharp distal fall off, right? The SOBP is, is slightly less sharp than the distal peak because it has contributions from the, from the peak uh, proximal to it, um, but it, it falls off within seven, eight millimeters, and there's no tail at the end, right? It drops to zero. Uh, the skin dose is less than 100%. It varies between. OK, so let's look at some definitions to characterize such a uh, uh, spread out break peak. So here again, you see a spread out break peak in water, normalized to 100% in the uniform dose region. Now, um, what we call the range is basically the uh, depth in water of the 90% distal fall off of the SOBP, right? 90%, so the range is this depth in water. And the modulation width is still in the proximal 90%. Um, so th this, this, is, this is sort of uh, a characterization of your beam, right? You can compare this to um, an energy on your LINAC. That sort of you select this energy so that determines the PDD that you're going to deliver. So in a proton beam, a field is defined by a range and a modulation width. And actually, instead of having discrete ranges that you can select, typically you can vary range and modulation width on a machine continuously. Um, okay, so here it's defined at the 90% level. Some centers use different isodose levels, right? The, ni the nice thing with the 90% is it's well defined, right? If you would want to define it to 100%, you can imagine that you're sensitive to noise or where exactly do you normalize. It, it, it varies quite a bit where then your 100% dose uh, ends up. Some centers use 98, some use 95. Traditionally, it's at the 90% level. Okay, so uh, that's the proton PDD. Now let's look at a proton 3D dose distribution. Uh, or 2D, actually. I, I took one, uh, one dimension away. So let's look at a phantom, 30 by 30 phantom, and I want to cover a 10 by 10 target in the middle, right? Left side, 15 MV x-ray. So I'm, I'm uh, shooting a beam from the right-hand side of the patient. And then if you look at the graph below here for the 15 MV beam, green is the PDD, so in the right-left direction. Orange is the lateral dose distribution. And obviously, because it's a single beam, you cannot cover the target uniformly. Now, I use on the right-hand side a proton SOBP, right? So coming again from the right-hand side of the patient. And my PDD modulation width is optimized to cover the target with 100%. There's a fall off, and the skin dose is about 80%, right? Um, so there's a distinct difference between the PDD X-rays protons. If you look at the lateral dose distribution, uh, it, it, there's some difference, but it's not that distinct, right? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the x-rays have some larger tail compared to the protons, but if you look at the 80 to 20 fall-off, the penumbra, it's not that different. Um, it's really in the, in the depth dose direction. So if you compare this, uh, so with protons, you can use one field to uniformly cover the target, lower entrance dose, no accident dose, but as I said, the lateral penumbra is not that different. But you did tell me, okay, I would never use one 15 MV beam. And on the other side, so you get uniform dose uh, for your 15 MV X-ray. Um, but let's do the same on the proton side, uniform dose. And you can see now because you weight the entrances on each side and there's still no exit dose, the dose in the beam path drops to 40% on the proton side, while for the X-rays, it's about 100, even bigger, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the difference now is really that there's lower dose in the beam path for the protons and lower integral dose, 
but you say, yeah, but I would never use two fields for this. Four field box. Four field box is what we do. That's what we need. Okay, so 15 MV, four field box, four directions. Those drops to about 50% in the beam entrance for the x-ray. You do the same for protons, and obviously there it also halves, so it drops to about uh, 20, 25%. Now look again at the high dose region and the lateral dose distribution. There's not, not much difference between the two. So it's not that protons, the, the potential benefit of protons is not like, oh, now all of a sudden I can conform my dose so much more better to the target than where before I had my target next to my brain stem and I needed, right? I, I, and there's only two millimeters in between and I could not spare the brain stem now with protons, something magic happens and I can do that. It's, it's, it's not that. It's really in the intermediate and low dose regions and the integral dose uh, is where the difference is in the two dose distributions. And you can see that when you look at the DVH of my simple plan, so if we, uh, the dash line here is the target coverage, so it's very similar, not surprisingly, but so if you look at the non-target dose, orange for four field photon and green for four field proton, that's really where the difference is, right? In these intermediate doses, you shift your isodose lines, um, sorry, you shift your uh, DVH lines to the left to lower doses. So your integral dose is lower, um, volumes getting intermediate doses are lower, but here on the high end side, it's very similar. And so I was thinking maybe that that's one question you could get at ABR, right? They show you a proton plan or they show two dose distributions and you need to recognize that it's a proton plan. So if you compare a, a proton plan, in this case a 3D conformal proton plan, um, to an IMRT plan, so it's typically characterized by fewer beams because each beam can, can cover the target uniformly and because it can do that um, and there's no exit dose, by using fewer beams there are really areas that you that you can completely avoid, right, that there will, no be, will be no dose. Um, and so the other difference is really that the proton plan doesn't have a, a low dose bath. Right, so in this case, this is a retro, retroperitoneal sarcoma case, uh, two field anterior proton beams, you see no dose anywhere else, the IMRT, five field IMRT plan, nice conformity in the high dose region, but you see these, this low dose bath and the intermediate dose is more spread out. Okay, that brings me to the end of this um, section. Um, so to recap, clinical PDD for a proton beam spread out break peak, defined by range and modulation width. If you look at what makes, what, what is special about a proton dose distribution, it's really lower integral dose. Okay, let's see if we have some questions. Ooh. Dustin Simonson. So in planning you want to minimize the necessary width of the SOBP to minimize entrance dose. Is this target geometry the primary determining factor when selecting gantry angles? Um, yes and no. Okay, let me explain. So, um, so yes, as part of uh, in, in in treatment planning, you want to limit the modulation width to cover the target and not make it more because you will <laughs> increase the entrance dose, as you say. Um, you have to keep in mind, though, and. The, the, the clinical implementation of proton therapy webinar, I assume we'll talk about that, is that there are uncertainties in the depth direction. So typically we, we add a margin on the distal end and the proximal end. So we typically increase the modulation with proximally beyond the geometric CTV to account for uncertainties. Um, but is this target geometry factor when selecting gantry angles? No. Not really. The, 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 the beam selection is more based on critical structures. So you, you find the angles that don't have a critical structure proximal to the target, right? Distal you don't really care, um, unless it's really close because then you have to deal with uncertainty. But, um, and then typically, because of uncertainties, we put in a couple of non-overlapping beam angles and, and uh, so because they're not overlapping, you can see that, let's say, if it's two fields, then the entrance dose is going to be 50% or less, right? So, um, okay. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, there's another.
another question. Oh, I hope I pronounced this right. ZQ um, so why so why we don't double RX dose to PDV to better kill cancer and maintain low dose to organs at risk since proton is good at sparing organs at risk. Um, well, um, that, okay, I think there are two answers to the question. Let's first talk about the dose distribution question to that. Typically, um, the target dose in your plan if it's limited by organs at risk, it's not by organs at risk that are sort of far away from the target, right? It's very often it's an organ at risk abutting the target, like lung cancer, right? It's lung around the, the lung cancer. So if you increase the target dose, you also increase the dose to the critical organs just around the target. So, so that's one issue. Uh, so typically, if you, if you talk about an IMRT plan, the, the limiting factor of the target dose is not the organs at risk in the, in the low dose path. Um, then the other thing is, which is more clinical, um, but part of it is we don't really know, right? So there, there are definitely cases where you could do dose escalation because of the dose distribution with protons. That hasn't been done that much yet um, because we really don't know what dose levels we can go to and if it really helps with local control, I think. Um, so, so, but, but that, obviously, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a whole different uh, question. Okay, this one should be easy. What's the clinical proton percentage depth dose curve called? Uh, the BRAC peak, the pristine peak, the smeared out BRAC curve, or the spread out BRAC peak? Okay, so it's uh, D, spread out BRAC peak, right? So BRAC peak and pristine peak are the monoenergetic percentage depth dose that are not used in clinical plants. Okay, so let's um, let's skip to technology. Um, so let's first talk about accelerators. So there are basically two types of accelerators used in uh, proton therapy, cyclotrons and synchrotrons. Um, cyclotrons are the more common um, accelerator. Uh, um, if you look at its state, so uh, Hitachi, offers a synchrotron-based system. So MD Anderson system in uh, Houston is synchrotron-based. The first hospital-based system in the US, Loma Linda, California, is, uh, is synchrotron-based. And basically, all the rest that are clinically operating uh, are cyclotron-based. OK, so let's, uh, let's go back to high school physics. So let's first talk about the cyclotron. Um, so in a cyclotron for proton therapy, so you have a proton source in the middle of the cyclotron. So a proton source typically consists of a uh, of a filament that heats an, uh, a hydrogen gas into a plasma. You get static polar protons out of the plasmas. So for all practical purposes, you can imagine a proton without any kinetic energy sitting in the middle of this uh, cyclotron here. Um, now. You have a um, accelerating gap. I, I hope I'm, I'm trying to point with my pointer, so I hope you see where I'm pointing. Um, so there's an electric potential across the accelerating gap. So because the proton is charged, the proton will be accelerated across the gap. Um, besides the accelerating gaps, the cyclotron has a magnetic field. In this case, points out of the uh, out of the pole up. So Lorentz. Um, has taught us that um, if a charged particle has a momentum um, in a magnetic field, that it will experience a force perpendicular to the magnetic field and the momentum of the particle, meaning that in a uh, constant magnetic field, it will start to spiral, right? So it's got a little bit of kinetic energy, it will start to spiral, and because it spirals, it meets the accelerating gap again. If at that point you've switched the potential of the acceleration uh, the opposite sign, it will be accelerated again, right? Now, Lawrence also says that the uh, radius with which the proton will um, spiral in a magnetic field is proportional to the momentum, right? So as it gains energy, it will start to spiral at a larger radius, 
meets the accelerating gap, a gap again, gets a little bit more energy, starts to spiral at a lar larger radius, on and on and on, basically until it reaches the end of the cyclotron, the magnetic pole, and then it has reached its maximum energy for this cyclotron. So you can see that the energy of the cyclotron is basically determined by its size, by its magnetic field, or for constant magnetic field, by the radius. Right? So the energy of the protons coming out of the cyclotron is always the same. So the cyclotron has fixed energy. Um, now, because when you're accelerating protons over the gaps, there's no reason why you cannot accelerate new protons. Right? So you constantly are accelerating protons that are bunched together per acceleration bunch as they, as they uh, cross the gap. But for all practical purposes, it's basically a continuous acceleration of protons. So there's a continuous beam coming out of the cyclotron. Now, you can have two types of magnets, conventional magnets, right? With wires and, uh, and a yoke, or uh, a superconducting magnet. So a superconducting ma magnet allows you to higher magnetic field and accelerate your protons up to the same energy with a smaller radius. So you can decrease the size of your, uh, of your cyclotron. So let's look at a, um, a real-life example of a cyclotron. So this is the IBA cyclotron that we have down here. You can see it here in the vault. It's about four me meters in diameter. So the RF frequency, the frequency with which we switch the accelerating field, is about is uh, 106 megahertz. So that tells you something about the pulse structure of the beam. The magnetic field is about two tesla. The energy of the protons coming out is 230 MeV, and the current is between 500 and 300 nanoamps. And the 300 nanoamps is really limited for safety and shielding reasons. It's no reason why you couldn't uh, push out more uh, current out of the cyclotron. So what it looks like. So um, you see, this is an acceleration gap. So instead of two acceleration gaps, actually, this cyclotron has four acceleration gaps, as you can see. This here is the yoke of the magnet, and it's shaped for focusing purposes. So the source sits inside here, protons are accelerated, and the extraction takes place here. And here you can see sort of the, with the cyclotron open, the opposite side, the, the, up, the upper part, and that's the, that's the, the same uh, design, right? So it, if it's closed, there's like a centimeter in between, it's under vacuum, protons are accelerated and extracted here. So this is the start of the beam line. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, synchrotron. Um, and this, let's look at the diagram first. Um, again, the pro path. And you change the magnetic field uh, in the magnets along the beam path, right? So you start, you, you will increase the energy in steps each time increasing the magnetic field in the uh, magnets until you've reached the desired um, energy. So it's difficult to start that with, uh, pro with protons of kinetic energy zero. So typically what's done is you have an injector, linear accelerator that accelerates the protons up to a certain energy, 7 MeV, 10 MeV, right? It's here, then it's brought into the synchrotron circle, and then you have an RF acceleration cavity here, that every time when the protons pass, gives it a kick, kick and increases the energy, right? The protons are kept in their path, which is increased to keep them in their uh, path. So you can do this until you've reached the desired energy, let's say 200 MeV, now you say you've, I've reached my energy, and now slowly you, you can start to strip the protons and send them down the beam line. So that's called the spill. You accelerate the protons, then you have to spill, meaning you, you spill the protons out of the loop, send them down the beam line, and at the end of the spill, you decelerate any protons that are left, you bring down the magnetic field again, and you start over again. So this diagram here uh, shows a typical spill structure. You start with injection, then acceleration, maybe a second, then extraction, half a second to five seconds, and then deceleration, and then you start over again. So this is um, a real-life example. So this is the Hitachi synchrotron. Uh, here's the injector, uh, right? The linear accelerator goes into into the into the synchrotron here. The RF cavity is extracted here and sent into the beam line. So as I said, 7 MeV, the energy coming out of the injector, 
um, so they can accelerate energy levels between 70 and 250 MeV. Uh, they do use this what's called slow extraction and what I said acceleration time a second, spill length half a second to five seconds and deceleration time one second. So now let's put the cyclotron and synchrotron next to each other. Um, so synchrotron fixed energy, right? A synchrotron variable energy, but typically discrete. Typically they commission a, a limited set of energies that they send down the beam line. So then the energy, for example, they have 10 energy. And they fine tune it then in the, uh, in the treatment head. But because the cyclotron has fixed energy, you need a system outside of the cyclotron to get the right energy that you want to send into the room. Basically, the range of a field determines what energy you need in the room. So a cyclotron uses like a degrader and an energy selection system, which is typically a wheel made of carbon that degrades the energy of the beam. And a synchrotron obviously doesn't need that. A cyclotron has a continuous beam current. A synchrotron has the spill structure, so it's non-continuous, right? It has these spills of, of a couple of seconds, and then a couple of seconds next, and then a couple of seconds beam on, a couple of seconds beam off. Cyclotrons typically can have higher beam currents. A uh, synchrotron not as, high, not as high. A cyclotron as a, typically a smaller footprint, um, and cyclotron is designed for a single ion type, and a synchrotron in principle can also accelerate other ions. Um, I don't know of any proton therapy center that's, that does that. Maybe in Japan there's some centers, but I'm, I'm not aware. So let's then show my question. Okay, so what is the main advantage of a cyclotron over a synchrotron for a proton therapy system? A, cyclotrons generally accelerate the protons to a higher energy and therefore have a higher maximum penetration depth or range in tissue. B, cyclotrons have a much smaller footprint and therefore require a significantly smaller, hence cheaper volt. Cyclotrons have a continuous beam eliminating interplay effects between the spin of the beam. D, cyclotrons are cheaper. What our poll reveals is that uh, it's kind of evenly split between B and C. There were a couple of outliers for A and D, but B and C both have eight, nine answers. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that's good. Um, so my correct answer is um, C. So B, uh, as I said, I mean, a cyclotron is typically um, smaller than a synchrotron, but then again, if you... Um, if you if you look at all the hardware that you need around the cyclotron and also the fact that you need this degrader and energy selection system um, at the exit of the cyclotron, actually the volts uh, of the cyclotron are not that much smaller than a synchrotron. So the, uh, B is not correct because it's significantly. It might be a little bit smaller but not significantly. So C is correct because as I said for all practical purposes purposes cyclotrons have a continuous beam and as we will see uh, when we talk about the delivery techniques when you start to scan the beam you basically start moving the beam um, with time structures comparable to the spill structure of the uh, of the synchrotron so you need to be really careful of interplay effects and you need to stop the beam um, um, yeah, so you, 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 you need to make sure that there's no interplay effect there. So my, my answer is C. Uh, but uh, B is not completely wrong, to put it that way. And Sim asked the question, is Mevion really just a gantry mounted cyclotron? Yes, so uh, Mevion system, so the, the cyclotron there is a superconducting cyclotron with a very high magnetic field, I think nine Tesla. So they make it really small, it's, about, it's in the order of a meter. And because they make it so small and light, they can mount it on a gantry and rotate the uh, cyclotron around the patient. So that's nice because you don't need the whole vault for your uh, cyclotron. The gantry structure is yeah, is pretty big. Other other proton gantry structures are big too, but it's still pretty big. So it's not like a uh, uh, the size of a, of a Linux yet. Um, the drawback obviously is you have one cyclotron for one room while most proton centers uh, have one accelerator that feeds into different rooms. So if you need two, you need two cycles. Okay. okay, so now we've accelerated the protons. Let's talk about proton delivery. 
Um, okay, so as I said, for a cyclotron, uh, you first need to give the beam the right energy, given the field range. So you need the energy selection system. And if you, if you look on the, on the two pictures down here, so they're not very clear, but this is the IBA system, the cyclotron beam coming out. This is this energy selection system to give it the right energy, and then the beam lines feeding into the different gantries. And look at the size of these gantries structures, right? Um, this is really uh, two and a half stories high. Uh, and then the synchrotron here with, with the synchrotron and then the beam line feeding into different rooms. So this fixed beam line room and this is a gantry room. Okay, so you transport the beam into the room uh, using a beam line. And there's mostly uh, dipole magnets to bend the beam, quadruple magnets to keep the beam focused and in the, uh, in the beam pipe. The beam pipe is under vacuum. Um, and then you rotate it uh, to the right angle with respect to the patient, so then you get these gantry structures, right? And these are so big uh, that it has to do with the mass of the protons, right? Because of the high mass, you need uh, the, 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 the bending radius of the protons is not very big, uh, so you need big magnets, long magnets to bend the protons. So, right, in this case, the gantry is at zero, you need to bend the protons up and then down, and the patient. So that's why you need this big gantry structure. And the other thing, as we will see, the treatment heads or the nozzle in proton therapy are long compared to a Linux uh, treatment head. So you talk about three meters. So you need to have this three meter long treatment head that you need to rotate around the patient with sufficient clearance. And that makes these, uh, these gantries so big. Okay, but so um, let's talk about proton delivery then. So proton delivery is... Um, the transformation of the monoenergetic proton beam into a 3D dose distribution, right? If we wouldn't do anything, we would have these protons of the right energy, uh, they would enter the room, and since it's just monoenergetic, they would deliver a uh, break peak, sharp break peak, and the spread of this beam is maybe uh, a centimeter, so you would get like this, this uh, centimeter wide Gaussian. Right? Spread the beam into a 3D dose distribution. So, um, the classification of these delivery systems, I mean, that's not, this is basically my classification. I don't think there's like consensus on how to do that. But I sort of try to do it um, to mirror what you have in conventional radiotherapy. So if you talk about 3D conformal delivery systems, they spread the beam into a large uniform dose distribution, like a large cylinder, right, if you would take everything out of the beam. Um, and then you use a field-specific collimator called an aperture in proton therapy typically, which is like a block, conventional therapy, and a range compensator to conform the dose to the target. Right? And how to spread the beam to this large uniform dose distribution, there are different systems for it. For example, you have double scattering systems and uniform scanning systems, and I'll talk in a little bit what, what they are. And then you have uh, pencil beam scanning deliveries. So now instead of spreading the beam to a large uniform dose distribution and using a block and range compensator, you take this small, you, the small beam, you keep it as small as possible, and you basically paint in the target, right? You move this small pencil beam in the target, and you start changing the energy to move in depth inside the target uh, to conform the dose to the target. And there you have spot scanning systems, meaning they move the beam to a, to a position, turn the beam on, and move to the next position, turn the beam on, turn the beam off again, or what's called raster scanning systems, where they continuously move the beam and have the beam on and vary the beam current. Um, this is not very common and it's very complicated, so I'll, I'll just be talking about spot scanning systems. So 3D conformal delivery, meaning double scattering and uniform scanning systems, uh, are older. They've really been the workhorse of proton therapy for a couple of decades. I think if you look at the number of patients being treated today, probably it's still a little bit more with 3D conformal, but all new centers, and they're opening up quite a few new centers, uh, are typically pencil beam scanning systems only. So they're they're newer, but they're gaining gr ground quickly. This has really been started, started being used clinically, um, at least in the US, five, six years ago. Uh, okay, so let's talk about a double scattering system. Um, in my diagram, the beam comes in from the left-hand side, monoenergetic beam, right? So the beam is spread to a flat lateral dose distribution at the isocenter by a flat first scatterer, in this case, piece of lead foil, and a contoured second scatterer that you see here. 
and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit exactly how that's done. But these two elements spread the beam into a flat dose distribution at isocenter. For our system, it's, it's a radius of 24 centimeter diameter uniform dose. Now, the SOBP, we, we saw before, you need to create the SOBP by adding the different pristine peaks with appropriate weight and pullback, is created by a range modulator wheel. It sits here. It's a spinning range modulator wheel, and this I will also explain in the next slides. Uh, and then, if you don't do anything, these two basically create a cylindrical uniform dose distribution, so the dose is conformed to the target by a field-specific block, the aperture, and a range compensator that conforms the dose to the distal end of the target. So the range in patient, so how deep is the distal end of the target, determines the beam energy at nozzle entrance, right? Beam energy coming here, so what, what energy do you ask from your synchrotron, or how do you do your energy selection with your cyclotron? And the modulation width determines how many steps of your range modulator wheel you're going to irradiate. And let me explain that a little bit more uh, on this slide. So how does a range modulator wheel create a spread out break peak? So the blue spot here is the beam going into the slide. This is a wheel rotating in the counterclockwise direction. Um, let's say the beam is turned off, turned on when, when the beam is on the first step, in this case, and you can see that the step has a certain water given thickness. Value doesn't really matter, 1.8 cm. Angular width of 76 degrees, right? While the beam is on this first step, it irradiates the distal peak of the spread out break peak. Now it hits the second peak, and you can see that it's thicker, right? Five millimeters thicker, so it pulls the, be the beam back five millimeters, the second peak, five millimeters lower range, and the angular width of the step is less, 27 degrees, less protons hitting that step, so the weight of that peak is less. And angular width, and the angular width is designed such that if you irradiate five steps in this case, it adds up again to your uniform dose distribution and spread or break peak. Let's say that five peaks is enough to cover this target. At this point, the beam is turned off until the wheel has completed the cycle, and then the beam is turned on again, right? And now, as I said, the modulation width determines how many steps are irradiated. So if you have a field with a modulation width of 10, then you will irradiate more of the step, more of the wheel before you turn off the beam. So in our system, this wheel spins at 10 hertz. So uh, the SOBP is delivered 600 times per minute, right? So there is some time structure, obviously, in delivering of these peaks, uh, peaks but because the wheel spins so fast, for all practical purposes, you can assume that SOBP is delivered uh, instantaneously. Okay, this is, this is what these wheels look in reality. So the IBA system has, a wheel, has wheels with different tracks, and tracks are used for certain energy span, right? So if you look here at the inner track, this is the first step, second step, third step, and you can see steps become thicker and narrower. Um, the IBA system only has one times the pattern per rotation. So if you look at the Hitachi nozzle, you can see they repeat the pattern. So they have a much steeper pattern, and it's repeated eight times. Uh, it spins a little bit less fast, but because the, the pattern is repeated, the actually repetition rate of the SVP delivery is, uh, is, is higher. Right? If you look here in the graph, this is where the beam would come in, and this part would spin in the beam. Uh, let's, let's look at the second scatter. As I said, the second scatter is used to create the flat dose distribution. So the, the main scattering in the second scatter is done by the high Z material. So in this case, lead, as you see here, form. So the beam hits it from the right-hand side. It's a Gaussian shape. And because it's thicker on the in, in the center than on the outside, protons scatter more in the center than on the outside. So over a drift distance, more protons will have moved from the center to the outside than the opposite. And if you optimize the shape appropriately, you can optimize it so that at isocenter, uh, the fluence is flat. Now you see on the other side, there's some low Z material. And that's basically, if you wouldn't do anything because the protons going through the center will lose more energy, um, there will be energy variation as a function of radial position. So what's being done is you add a low, low Z material on the other side to make sure the energy loss is the same, but still the scattering is more in the middle than on the outside. 
And if you compare it to a flattening filter, so the function is the same, right? Over a you, you attenuate more, more in the middle to get a flat de dose distribution at isocenter. But so the physical interaction behind it is different. So a second scatterer has differential scattering. A, a flattening filter for photons has uh, differential attenuation. And now let's um, look at the range compensator. So I said a field-specific uh, collimator or block is used to conform the tar to conform the dose to the target uh, laterally. And a range compensator is used to conform the dose to the distal end of the target. So if we go back to our spread out break peak, if, if uh, we have a certain range, obviously the beam penetrates to the same depth, uh, to the same depth at every lateral position in a water phantom, right? Now in a, in a, in a clinical case, like you can see here on the left, obviously the depth of each point on the distal end of the target for this beam is different. So if you basically take, um, let's say the deepest point of the target is here, if you look at this ray, uh, the depth of, of this point might be five millimeters left. So a range compensator puts five millimeters of material in, in here to reduce the energy so that the penetration depth or the range along this ray ends up at the distal end of the target. Right, so treatment planning looks determines the depth, water given depth of each point of the target, which is defined by the shape of the target, the shape of the of the skin of the entrance, and um, in homogeneities, so the density of the target, and how exactly that's done will be presumably part of the of the next webinar. Um, but then it, it looks at the def the changes in depth along the target and puts the appropriate amount of range compensation material to compensate for that. So that's the range compensator. And so here you see the effect of a range compensator in a water phantom. This is the shape of the target. So by shaping it like the, the distal end of the target, you can conform the dose very nicely to the distal end. But you can see you need a certain modulation width to, to cover the whole target. Um, since the SOBP width is the same everywhere, you don't conform on the proximal end. Right? So that's one thing with 3D conformal proton therapy. You conform very nicely to the distal end, but not on the proximal end. So these are practical examples of range compensators and apertures. So on the left-hand side, you see range compensators. So this is a wax range compensator. This is a, uh, a lucite range compensator. So they're, they're milled on CNC machines. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see uh, apertures, brass, um, some centers, maybe just one center, use, uh, uses uh, band apertures. Being and so typically these aperture and range compensator are mounted on a snout at the end of the treatment head and you can move the close to the patient to decrease the air gap because the geometric source size of a proton scattering or uniform scanning system is typically pretty big so you want to make the air gap as small as possible to, uh, to make the penumbra as small as possible. So this snout can move in and out. Uh, so these are some practical examples of double scattering nozzles. So the Hitachi double scattering nozzle, the IBA um, doubles, uh, unifor, universal nozzle, and it's called universal because it can do double scattering and uniform scanning and pencil mu scanning, and that's why it has these scanning magnets in here as well. So it has the fixed scatter, range modulator, then the scanning magnets, variable collimators, molecular chamber. And I, I told you that the treatment head of a proton therapy system is pretty long. So from here to the end of the nozzle, from the beginning is three meters. And they have another, no, oh, sorry, it's two and a half meters. And they have another 50 centimeters to isocenter. And something similar for the Hitachi nozzle, right? So this is three meters from the where the beam enters the nozzle and the isocenter. Okay, then one slide about uniform scanning. So now... Uh, instead of spreading the beam with the second scatterer, you can use magnets to spread the beam. You basically make your spot a little bit bigger, and then you use two magnets, two dipoles at fixed frequency to move the beam up and down and left and right. And in our case, the first magnets move the beam up and down with a, with a frequency of 30 hertz, and the second magnet moves it left and right with a frequency like this rectangle back and forth of the beam being scanned in a rectangular pet pattern. Um, because the time structure of the scanning is pretty similar to the uh, frequency of the range modulator wheel if you would rotate it, now actually the range modulator wheel is used in stationary mode. 
meaning that instead of spinning the wheel, you first set it on the first step, deliver all the dose for the first step, then go to the second step, deliver all the dose for the second step. And so because you deliver the SOBP now energy layer by energy layer, pristine peak by pristine peak, that's called energy stacking. And it's still 3D conformal proton therapy, so conforming to the target, again, aperture and range compensator. And because you use an aperture range compensator, that means that the dose distribution looks very similar to double scattering. In a static plan, you will not be able to see the difference between the two. Although the beam is spread in a completely different way using magnets uh, instead of scatterers, the dose distribution is very similar. Uh, Boy Gautam, 553. Can different energies be delivered at different gantries or it has to be the same? That's a, that's a good question. So actually, um, because each field asks its own energy, um, the, the, the accelerator, cyclotron or synchrotron, has to be set for that specific energy. So you only deliver beam into one gantry at a time. right? So that means that if you're radiating in one gantry, the other gantry has to wait until the first gantry is done, and then the cyclotron has to be switched to the, to the new energy, and then uh, irradiation can take place in the, uh, in the second gantry. Um, so Guy Jambigoma, can you talk about the resistance? No, <laughs> I could, but uh, um, I'm not sure it's going to be very sensible. And, uh, but, uh, so my colleague will do the next webinar, and I think she will um, include that. And if not, I will ask her to include that. Um, just as a preview, it's not that there's like this nice formalism, like you use it for photons, uh, right? Your, your, your nice equation where you can explain all the, uh, all the elements that doesn't really exist. Um, Dustin Simonson, on your range modulator wheel, on your range modulator slide, why is there a difference in the entrance dose for the deepest break beam versus the other protons beams? Oh. Okay, I hope you mean this slide. Uh, if not, uh, with the higher energy protons, I would have expected lower entrance dose. Um, th that that is um, that is true. If you would normalize them both to 100%, right? You would normalize the peaks the same. Then you're absolutely correct that the the entrance dose for the deepest peak would be less than for the second peak. The reason why this is much higher than this is because the weight of this peak, the number of protons in this peak, is much higher than these. And that's just because you waited to get the flat dose distribution. One percent. The deeper one would have a lower skin dose, but it's just because I, I, they're normalized to give a flat dose distribution. That's why these show a much lower skin dose. Marin Bodo, what is the minimum field size which you can have it? Um, I guess you're talking about double scattering uniform scanning. So that's really, since you use a field specific aperture, the minimum field size is really limited by what you can mill. And um, so that's very small. Um, smaller than any practical target. So you can uh, proton beams. The problem is, like with any other small uh, field delivery, is that you start to lose fluence equilibrium. Right? So you have no longer a uniform region, and you get all these problems with calibrating for monitor units and this and that. But there, there's no practical limit uh, of the field size you can have with a, a 3D conformal uh, system. Uh, Jacqueline, I assume, Santiago Esteban, 50 centimeter to ISO treatment distance. Yes, from the end of the, uh, of the, of the nozzle, of the treatment head to ISO center. This cover here, that's the end of the, of the treatment nozzle, right? And so then it's 50 cm to ISO center, and this snout can move putting the range compensator at ISO center or all the way into the uh, treatment head. So yes, that's 50 cm. Let me go to the review. Okay, I'm getting a little bit tired since since you're going to answer it uh, anyway. So Mel, um, I won't read this question so I can drink some water and maybe uh, you you 
pick it up and see when, when everybody has answered. So the poll is live, so everybody should go out and uh, vote, and you'll be able to see uh, what the other people in the poll are saying. So it looks like answer D is coming in with the largest number of votes. Okay. I'm, I'm happy about that because it's the correct answer. So I'm going to quickly go over the answer. So A, so double scattering system doesn't allow for tracking of the tumor, right? Because you have this fixed aperture, so there's no way of tracking it. Pencil beam scanning, I'll know, but no, although nobody does it yet, and we'll see that next. Um, in principle, does allow for tracking of the tumor, but because you have hardware in 3D conformal program therapy, you, you cannot track. A double scattering system has a smaller lateral penumbra, B resulting in better conformality. No, so double scattering system, uniform scanning system, as I said, those distribution very similar. Um, C, so, I mean, there is an issue with, with uh, magnetic fields and especially modulating magnetic fields uh, potentially for pacemaker patients, so you, you need to make sure that the magnetic field is not too high. Um, but it has nothing to do with lung, lung, the heart function of uh, lung patients. So that's that sort of nonsense. And uh, yes, so the time structure of uniform scanning. Free slow merge. Um, and on top of that, you do this energy stacking. So you, have, you deliver first all the dose of the distal layer, and then you switch to the next layer. You can imagine if there's a, a significantly different position or depth of the tumor for the different energy layers, you, you, you don't add up to a uniform dose and you can get uh, hot spots or cold spots. Okay, so, so that was 3D conformal uh, delivery system, aperture range compensator, and your delivery system spreads the beam to a large uniform dose distribution that you basically uh, conform with the patient-specific hardware. So now pencil beam scanning system, uh, the system itself is pretty simple. You take everything out of your nozzle except your magnets, uh, you bring the, the, the beam in at, the, uh, at a certain energy, and you try to keep the beam as small as possible, meaning you try to avoid any scattering. So the best systems do that by bringing, up vac bringing vacuum very close to the patient, sometimes upstream of the magnets. Uh, I don't think there's any system that does it downstream. So anything that's still left in the treatment head, so you still, you still need ionization chambers, of course, um, but these are designed to be as thin as possible, to scatter the beam as little as possible. So then you end up with a monoenergetic pristine peak of a very small size, the Gaussian at isocentric, right? Um, and it depends a lot on your system what that final size is. But so for the best systems at the highest energies, the spot size at isocenter might be three and a half, four, five millimeters, so pretty small. Uh, typically for, for lower energies, because as I said, lower the energy, more scattering. The spot size becomes bigger because of scattering in the ionization chamber, scattering in air. So then you might look at seven, eight, nine, the worst systems, maybe one and a half centimeters at isocenter. Um, but now you take this, this pencil beam and you can move it to any position, right, using, again, your two magnets, two doubled magnets, to move it in each of the two directions. And so you can make a spot pattern by moving your beam to fixed uh, spot pattern positions. And you can also vary the depth of your break peak by changing the energy of the beam coming in. So this is, again, energy stacking. So typically you deliver all the spots for one energy, the highest energy for the distal layer, then you change the energy of your synchrotron or the energy degrader in your cyclotron, and then you deliver all the spots in the next energy layer that has slightly lower energy, and, and, and you sequentially step through the energy layers, uh, sequentially decreasing the energy. And now you can, uh, and the number of protons that are delivered in each spot, meaning each position and each energy, you can optimize the, the monitor units for a given spot. Um, and obviously now you don't need aperture or range compensator anymore to conform the dose because you conform the dose with the, uh, with the, the, the beam itself. Um, and treatment planning then in, instead of becoming sort of a forward planning process where you design your aperture and range compensator based on the geometry of your target, it becomes an, uh, an optimization process. 
right? Very similar to uh, to IMRT, where the spots, the energies, the positions, and the amount of units are optimized to give you the best uh, dose distribution. And uh, this we I touched on before. So you have different delivery. You deliver the dose spot by spot. You go to the position, deliver the dose. Or you have continuous or raster scanning where the where the magnets continue to modulate, moving the the, the beam continuously, and the, the beam current is modulated as the beam uh, moves through the target. And there are not many systems like that. Okay, so if you look then at a, a PBS spot map file, um, so the PBS delivery then consists of a sequential delivery of proton pencil beams. It's defined by the energy spot position and dose. Um, because it's faster to switch from one position to the next, right? Move the beam from one spot to the next, and to change the energy, we have to go back to your accelerator to change the energy and bring it in again. PBS fields are typically delivered um, energy layer by energy layer, as I said. And for now, so ours, which is not a very advanced system, takes about one and a half seconds to change from one energy to the next. In a uh, in a spot map, so you can imagine that if you talk about 30 layers, that's quite a bit of overhead to change the energy. So that means that typically also spot maps are delivered. Each spot is only delivered once, and sort of the holy grail is to make the systems fast enough that you can actually um, it's called repainting. So go through your spot map four or five times very fast, um, so you minimize um, the effects of interplay with motion. Uh, so a spot map, depending on, on, on the extent of the target, the modulation width, right, can have different amounts of layers. So it's similar as your SOVP, how many energy layers you, you add proximally to cover your target. And several hundreds or thousands of spots per energy. Spot size. Obviously, if you have a very small spot, you need a lot of spots. And optimize the weight uh, based on optimization objectives. As I said, because of the time structure of PBS delivery, you need to be concerned about interplay effects. And that's a, if, if you look at, if you go to double APM meetings or look at papers, a lot of, of the research in program therapy is towards that. How do you minimize interplay effects? And there's a lot of talk about robust optimization. So that in your optimization, you already take care of that. And just uh, in the next webinar, there will be more about this, but just to show you what you can do. So with your PBS, you could do something that's called single field uniform dose. So each beam covers the target uniformly. Right? In this case, we have, um, I don't know, I guess it's a base of skull treatment with three beams, one, two, three. And if you look at the 100% dose, the red, each and then this is the composite dose. So the dose distribution here is not that different from a 3D conformal beam distally and laterally. What's the difference is the PBS can also conform proximally. What I showed you before that a 3D conformal beam cannot do that. But instead of having each beam cover the target uniformly, you can do intensely modulated proton therapy, the equivalent of IMRT, and having your treatment planning optimize um, weights and spots over all beams simultaneously, depending on the um, objectives you've put in. Right. So in this case, uh, there's the brainstem that needs to be avoided. So you can see that this beam puts in lots of those here. Brainstem, and each beam individually doesn't cover the target, but you add them up. Now you can see that you can actually form the high dose region and stay out of the brainstem here, what you couldn't do with your 3D conformal delivery. Um, just a preview, so single field uniform dose, intensive modulated protein therapy. If you go to the next webinar, uh, Dr. Flampori will tell you more about that. So let's go to the review question then. I propose you read it yourself again, and then uh, leave it up to Mel to uh, announce the results. So the poll is live, so go ahead and put in your answers. So overwhelmingly, the uh, chosen answer is D. Yeah, okay. It's always D, all of the above. Okay, yes, so that's correct. Um, so yeah, PBS doesn't use average range compensator, so that, that's, that's uh, 
a drawback of most current systems where therapists have to go in in between fields to, uh, to change the hardware. Um, so PBS allows for better conformality um, for one because it allows to conform proximally to the target and also with IMPT it allows to better shape the high ice dose lines and get like uh, um, uh, concave uh, dose distributions. Um, and PBS generates less out of field dose is greatly reduced. Yeah, so as, as I said, wherever a proton beam there's a chance of nuclear interactions creating neutrons and more so for high Z materials, so things like the aperture is a big neutron source for the patient. So, so, so PBS beam doesn't really interact with the nozzle, right, except the ionization chambers, but they're so thin. But that doesn't mean there's, there's no neutrons, because obviously as the, as the beam traverses the patient itself, there are also new, uh, um, nuclear interactions, and that also creates neutrons that are deposited outside of the, uh, of the target. So the, the rule of thumb is that for a double scattering system, or a uniform scanning system, a 3D conform system, about half the neutron dose outside the target is from the nozzle, and half of it is from, from the patient, right? So you got the neutron out of field dose in half. Rough rule of thumb. Okay, so let's go to the last two slides. As I said, this is not really my expertise, um, but I could imagine that there might be a question about this. The good thing is that I think there are not many people who, who did, whose expertise this is. Right? You, you, if you talk about Linux shielding, I mean, you do it in your master's degree. There are like these reports that exactly show you step by step and ground shine and floor shine and calculation formalisms and the idea is that everybody should be able to do that uh, for their Linux. Um, to be honest, with protons, that, that, that doesn't exist. And so you have a few experts and they say, okay, I can do it for you, give me so much money, and they do it, but there's no formalized protocol, so they use a lot of more to come up with the design. So, yeah, don't be afraid that they able to ask similar type of questions that they do for a uh, Linux Vault design or a CT uh, design. But anyway, so that doesn't mean that you cannot say anything about it, so um, going back to the interactions, so the shielding is really for neutrons. Right? There are no primary protons escaping the patient like with x-rays, it's really neutrons. And so the, the, the walls are typically uh, made of concrete, and I show you an example here of a center in Germany. So the walls are about two to three meters. Um, thickest way you degrade or stop most of the beam, so often around the cyclotron, they're thickest. There's often like a beam stop that you can dump the beam in. Um, and obviously to, to, to limit those outside there. Uh, so if you look at the maze, so um, these neutrons, they bounce basically off the wall and, and, and become thermal neutrons, so you have this thermal uh, neutron cloud that can sort of drift towards your door, right? So the, the maze needs to be long enough to reduce the, uh, the thermal neutron fluence. Uh, once it reaches the door, typically those doors are not shielded anymore. Right? So you can see here, there's a maze with two corners, and then these are just normal doors, typically with glass and, and, and wood, and not shielded. Um, here they put in an extra wall, because the beam comes in like that, so there's a risk of primary beam if there's no patient, right? Um, okay, so th there's this PT Corp presentation by one of the experts. I try to go through it and <laughs> give you some, <laughs> some more uh, uh, details. What I said, it's a lot of physics and uh, yeah, d difficult, at least for me, to understand. So I wouldn't recommend to, uh, to try to do that. So what about radiation safety? Um, there's not a whole lot special for peripheral therapy. So if you look at uh, personnel monitoring, so the badge that are, badges that are worn and the rings are, are very similar. So therapists wear rings because they handle the, uh, the apertures, right? Um, our, our badges also have a neutron chip, but it, I'm not sure if that's, this, if that's also the case in conventional centers. I think probably that's standard now on all uh, film badges. So it has like this, um, yeah, this material that etches if a neutron uh, passes through it. If you look at the, the, the radiation levels, they're very low, uh, similar to conventional cl clinics, and mostly actually from in-room imaging. So we have in-room uh, x-ray imaging. 
shielding specific. Uh, so the field specific apertures get activated, so they, they're used for um, for all fractions of a treatment. Obviously, in the, there are multiple fields, so the dose is sort of spread, but uh, because it's high Z, those can get activated. So handling the ozone on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't really cause any problems, so our finger badges typically don't see much, don't see any reading at all. Um, for disposal, it's a little bit of an issue, so you need to store them until the method activation is at background. So we store them for three months, then we take our um, 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 radiation monitor, the pancake, put it on there and see if it's background. If it is, it can be disposed of. If not, we keep it for another month. And range compensators, because they're lower Z and they don't really um, absorb the beam, right? because the, 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 the aperture basically it's the beam and then uh, the smaller beam goes through the range compensator, they don't uh, show any measurable activation. So actually if patients want to take them home as a souvenir after treatment, we, uh, we give them to, uh, to them. Um, and that's all I had to say about that. Let's see if there are any questions. Dustin uh, Simonson, it sounds like highly accurate real-time imaging of moving target is absolutely critical with spot scanning systems. Um, uh, no. It would be nice. Um, so, a fantasy, sort of what people are maybe hoping for, is because you have this very small beam, you steer it with the magnets. It's what you say. If you had, had like real time good imaging, you could actually have your uh, pencil beam follow the target, right? Uh, th this is future. I mean, th nobody does this. Um, so, it, it, yeah, there, there's a risk with a spot scanning system uh, for lung that there's interplay effects and you get hot spots and cold spots. So there are a lot of studies that sort of show like if you do repainting, right, so you deliver the spot map twice or three times, all those problems disappear quite quickly. If you um, scale, some of these problems also disappear. If you not look just for a single fraction, but if you look over three, four, five fractions, those problems also become less. Um, the other thing you can do is to, and this goes to this robust optimization, actually have your treatment planning system optimized not just on a static CT, but on all 10 phases of a 40 CT, for example, right? And they say um, you want to cover the target you want a certain uh, uniformity if you sum over all these targets. Um, um, so you basically make um, make the uncertainty of the moving target part of the optimization. So this is a robust optimization. Um, treatment planning systems, commercial treatment planning systems are so, so the approach that, that uh, so a couple of years ago everybody said pencil spot scanning you shouldn't do it for long. Now people have started doing it for bigger targets with less motion, and slowly it's sort of people are going to smaller targets and more motion based on these studies that have been done. Um, okay, class vessels. Can you shortly comment on the different range verification systems, although are mostly scientific? Okay, so I assume you're um, asking about in vivo range verification. Um, so let's first explain why that is important. So one of the biggest uncertainties in proton therapy is to accurately predict based on CT um, what actually the penetration depth of your proton beam is going to be. So it depends a lot on how you translate the Hounsfeld units into uh, stopping power and it depends a lot on anatomical changes that can happen uh, over time. So um, although the, 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 the proton beam has a very short, sharp fall off, we cannot make full use of it because we need to add a margin distally to the target to account for those uncertainties. So what people are looking for is maybe in vivo you can measure where the proton beam stops uh, and decrease the distal margins that we use. Uh, so things that are people are looking at is, for example, uh, what I said, this this activation inside the patient, so sometimes nuclear interactions create um, um, radioactive isotopes, right? For example, prompt gamma emitters. So you have people looking with gamma cameras during delivery to see where these prompt gammas are. 
created for beta emitters. So um, people are, are, are looking with bad systems where these beta emitters are created. And that way, you can sort of get an idea where the protons pass. The problem is a little bit that dose deposition, right, that we talked about before, the first interaction, uh, energy loss with the shell electrons, is not really one-to-one -one correlated with nuclear interactions. So it's not necessarily wherever dose is deposited, these radioisotopes are generated. Um, so one thing, for example, is that the cutoff energy for nuclear interactions is typically, um, I don't know, and, and not very low. So in the distal end would be where exactly you would like to know where it falls. There's no um, activation takes place. So people use Monte Carlo methods to calculate what you expect in this and that. So people are looking at that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, you asked for shortly. I don't think this was shortly. Um, okay. I think I've been talking too long. So let me show you the last question. Okay, you can read it for yourself, and then we'll hear from Mel what the results are. So the poll is open, and we are looking for your votes. Okay, answers are coming in overwhelmingly for option C. No, oh, yeah, that was an easy one. Okay, yeah, I won't go through the answers. I, I assume it's pretty. Uh, Pretty obvious. Unless somebody wants to explain why their answer is wrong, want me to explain why their answer is wrong, uh, I won't go over them. Okay, so that brings me back to the learning objectives. Uh, we talked about interactions, dose distributions, two accelerators, delivery. Um, as I said, clinical therapy, like commissioning like uncertainties, like what kind of cases do we treat, what does a dose distribution look like for different cases, like RBE um, are going to be in the, uh, the second webinar. Um, these are the answers. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Rolf, we want to thank you so much. Um, this is not my field, and I think I learned something today, so I'm sure <laughs> Our attendees did as well, um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to put together this presentation and do this for our group. Um, yeah, as a reminder, the video that you saw today will be available to subscribers on the wepast.com website. If you have any questions about uh, subscribing or where the uh, webinar is going to be located, um, you can go ahead and go through, again, it's WePass, W-E-P-A-S-S-E-D, dot com. And there is a Contact Us There link. So, again, thank everybody so much for attending. Rolf, thank you for your presentation. And everybody should have a nice evening. <laughs>